We're going to uh, ask our next panelists to come forward. Because we have a next panel, which is really beautifully uh, feeding off some of what we talked about there, which is on talent and skills in the creative industries and how we might optimize the impact on the creative, work, the creative workforce can make to the creative economy. So I'm going to hand over to a new chair for this next session, who is Leslie Giles, Director of Work Advance, who's been involved with much of the PEX work in this area. So I'd like to welcome Leslie to the stage and also the, the panel, Professor Ruth McElroy, who is Head of the School of Arts, Culture and Languages at the University of Bangor. Robert Spectreman Green, who's Director of Media and Creative Industries at DCMS. Tolu Stedford, co-founder of Story Compound, and Katia Travkina, who is the coordinator of culture, creative industries, and local development at the OECD. So, Leslie and panel, the floor is yours. Thank you. Okay, we seamlessly switch places, and um, my head is already buzzing with the excitement of all the discussion and the new ideas we've had, so I hope we can keep uh, the level of interest and excitement going in this session. And already heard a lot from speakers about the importance of this panel discussion, which is on skills and talent, and so we really need to kind of embrace that um, education agenda. Um, as you've heard, I'm Leslie Giles, I'm chairing this session. We've also uh, recognised this morning the importance of diversity, so it's important that I also say uh, something um, visually in terms of a description about myself. Um, I'm white, I'm female. Um, in terms of where I come from, uh, I come from Nottingham, so um, I, I've lived in the UK my whole life, although I'd really like to have lived somewhere else. But, um, <laughs> at some point in my late. time, but it's yeah. not too late. Um, I'm wearing a green dress and black jacket, but I feel sort of looking at that lovely picture we had earlier um, of Harry Styles in a tutu. I feel a bit <laughs> inadequate. Of and the other thing I wanted to, to say in terms of my description um, around diversity is um, to say that I am in my 50s. Um, which I don't know where the time has gone, but one of the things I think is really important to draw attention to in the context of a education and skills uh, debate is having some kind of institutional memory because circles and going round them mm. endlessly and reinventing wheels. I mean, in, in the context of the importance of this investment piece, we do need to have some degree of continuity and stability over time. So that's something, you know, I'm, I'm starting off chair, so I'm going to kind of hog the floor in terms of making some important points. And the whole purpose of this, and perhaps this is where the interest is going to come from, people can disagree with me. Um, that is allowed. Um, so um, you can't hear me. OK, I need to jiggle this a bit. Is that better? So you haven't heard anything I've said? <laughs> it was absolutely fascinating. Um, so I've got an endless pile of things on my lap. I'm not quite sure why. So I'm going to get rid of those. Um, so what I wanted to do was um, to start off, and I do promise that I will allow other people to speak, um, but um, I did actually want to, to start off with some introductory um, remarks, which was just to um, really say something about the format for this session. We've all been in discussion already about it, so, so hopefully in that sense it won't be a surprise for anybody. Um, and then, um, really, I was going to set out some sort of thoughts, really, in terms of principles to set that we can kind of debate about in this session in terms of skills. And I think the first thing, I'm not really that complex in terms of format, but we are going to be doing this, um, going through this process of building on the approach that's already started within the conference, is that we kind of look back <laughs> and try to assess the performance of the different parts of the creative industries over time. And we'll try not be too gloomy about some of these um, issues, but really get to the heart of what we think has been behind that success. And obviously, this is about really focusing on skills and talent contribution and try to use insights to look forward to think about, you know, really picking up, I guess, the challenge which was set down as well in the earlier session about what does success look like? What do we want the future to look like in terms of the creative workforce, the effectiveness of that creative workforce, the contribution it can make, and how we can help support 
that creative workforce to make that contribution. And we've talked about already lots of features that are associated with the success of the creative industries in various ways. We've talked about research and development, we've talked about innovation, we've talked about early adopters of emerging technologies, shaping technologies, digitally enabled um, sectors, we've talked about globalization. But what are the features that are really important about the creative workforce? Can we unpack some of those? For a start, if we look at some of the analysis from the Creative Industries Policy and Evidence Centre, we see it's a highly skilled workforce. That's really important to underline. Highly qualified workforce. Three quarters, nearly, of the workforce have a degree or higher. And in some of the recent debates I've been at, the proportions, we think we're going to shift the dial even f further in the future in terms of the uh, proportions of people with higher degrees and higher qualifications. They're highly skilled workers. 95% of people that are working in the creative workforce work in creative occupations that are regarded as highly skilled. If we're talking about data and we look at standard occupation classification, everybody will switch off them because we hate that. But in that sense, the good story in using standard occupation classification in a creative context is that 95% of people are highly skilled. We have a very heterogeneous workforce. We have a very on, a high level of entrepreneurial activity. We have a um, high degree of freelance workers, double the rate of freelance workers to the economy as a whole, high proportions of small businesses, and a lot of thinking that that is a key aspect in terms of driving creativity and driving the innovation. And we're seeing that although we've had a period of subdued growth during the, the COVID pandemic, that we've had prior to COVID great growth in terms of employment and future trajectories expect us to return to those periods of growth. So that's the opportunity here that we need to unlock. The challenge is that we're already starting, as Peter was saying, you start to unlock economic activity, you start to drive skill shortages and skill deficiencies. You see where there are gaps in that kind of, um, in terms of latent skills gaps. And we're starting to see creative occupations featuring on the list of the government's migration advisory committee, increasing numbers, designers, digital experts, art officers and producers, architects, and I can go on. We know what the list is, probably. And also, we're thinking about the, the shortages in terms of you know, an aspect of the education agenda as the shortages more generally across the economy in terms of creative skills as a transversal skill and recognizing the importance of that if people are going to work effectively in a modern workplace and enable those technologies. So these are some of the opportunities and challenges. What can we do about it? And the good news, and I hope the, the panel are going to, to give us further insights and thoughts about, is that we are starting to take action. Each national government, each skills system in each national government, so that's England, Wales, Scotland and Northern Ireland, are reforming their education systems and trying to move towards lifelong learning approach, which supports development of young people. Yes, that's really, really important. We've heard a lot in the earlier session about schools and early education, but we actually need to drive lifelong learning of adults too, and to inspire people to continually reskill and upskill um, and learn so that they can optimize their contribution. The positive news is that systems are trying to move in that direction. What do we think about how far we're getting, how far, how far we still um, need to go? A second principle that I would identify from the education reforms is um, the need for data and LMI to use that data to understand developments in the, a dynamic labour market so the system can respond appropriately to those developments and adjust the curriculum and the content of training and skills programmes. That points to responsiveness in terms of the system. So the system then has to respond once it knows how um, I started to anticipate some of those skills and knows how the system is changing. And it's thinking about modern ways of delivery, modular learning, flexible learning, portable um, learning. What do we think about some of those different developments? And the final thing I will say um, by way of introduction is the importance of partnership in driving the skill system. And we've already talked about the multiple levels 
of delivery. It's not just about central government pushing things forward. It's about allowing enough flexibility at a local level so that local players can actually customise that provision so that it's pro appropriate and fit for purpose. And in particular, what's really key here is the whole notion of industry engagement end-to-end -end in the process in terms of shaping all of those things. So those are some of the things that I would draw attention to in terms of some of the potential, I think, in trying to move forward positively on the agenda. And those would be some of the opening remarks that I would make. But I'm now going to give the panel the opportunity to give their insights. And of course, I don't know if I can get that iPad to work, if somebody can help me in the boundaries. But I, I do want to give you the opportunity to ask questions as well, um, so that I can bring you into the discussion. So without further ado, I'm going to turn to Ruth. Hi. And to ask you, for your perspectives, if we can kind of start off, I mean, I suppose what we're trying to do here is kind of ebb, ebb and flow between part of that picture of success mm. is having a view on what the workforce looks like and where the workforce is going and where are some of those priority employment and skill needs. Mm. And if we can start to sort of think about that first and then think how do we need to respond to, to sort of meet those demands. Um, let me just, visual description, as, as someone who comes from a visually impaired family and is the daughter of a blind man, I'm not going to tell you I'm a woman because I know that you can work that out from what I'm saying <laughs> and the tone of my voice, but uh, I'm, a, I'm a white woman who's wearing an orange top because I'm somebody who does feel positive about life and actually thinks that one of the most important things that we've got to stop doing is just not being prepared to talk about pleasure, about joy, about feeling because as somebody who's you know last saturday i was doing an open day with prospective students and their mums and dads right and they are going around they could be going into my colleagues next door who are doing computing they could go into law they could go into finance and the thing that i say is all those other people can do really great things but when did you see a lawyer bring joy Right? <laughs> when did an accountant lift your heart? <laughs> the most important thing is we can make people imagine and yeah. feel things that they have never dreamt of, and that is a heck of a privilege. Mm -hmm. But in order to sustain the people who do that, we have got to stop exploiting people. It really isn't so complicated. We need to stop thinking that investing purely in entry level is yeah. in and of itself going to stop the problem. Yeah. I think of this as a bit like the water industry, right? And the criticism of water. And coming from Wales, water is such a political area. You might, if you're ever in Wales, you'll see signs, Cofiwch Trwerin, remember Trwerin, remember that a village was drowned for the sake of the resource, right? And in, in the heat of, of last summer, we started to see a whole village resurface. So water is a powerful comparison. I don't think it's ethical in a climate change emergency for water companies to think about turning the tap on ever more forcefully if what they're not doing is plugging all the leaks down the pipeline. <laughs> but it's not ethically right that that's what we're doing. So yes, I want to have opportunities for new entrants. And I think that absolutely, Leslie, you're right. That relationship between education and industry and policymakers, that's the foundation. You've absolutely got to have that. And when it works, it is absolutely a joy. That's the other thing. Um, you know, there are those moments where it can happen. And so often it happens because people have got some shared values. I think that's really key. But if we don't plug the gap, if we don't just stop hemorrhaging mid-career talent, and we know why people are leaving for the most part, it isn't that complicated. It's no childcare. Mm. It's how do you buy a house when you've never got a permanent job? These are things that we we have data on. We have lived experience. And we really, really need to think about how ethically we sustain our talent. Mm -hmm. We've talked a lot, quite rightly so far, about that fusion of creative tech. Those skills needs are really, really key. And hopefully we'll come back to that in terms of the curriculum. But it's also really striking from the research that I've done that we are massively underinvesting in leadership skills. Yeah. 
Yes, sister. Yeah. Mm. Yes. Sorry. I mean, Preach it. You, nobody's born able to do that. Yes. The first time anybody line manages people, it's a revelation, right? And how many of us actually got any support for that, got trained in doing any of that? Mm -hmm. We have a generation, I think, I can certainly see this in Wales in the film and TV sector, where there's a generational shift happening within indie companies. There isn't support for succession planning. People are doing their level best for sure, mm -hmm. but we are not investing sufficiently in that. In the research that we did within Clustered back in during the pandemic, we found that only 5% of training providers were providing training around leadership and business skills. 0.1% of the companies we surveyed were investing in those skills specifically. So there's a huge deficit there that I think we really, really need to target. Okay, that's fabulous. Now, I was going to go to Katia to sort of contrast a UK perspective with the international, but I have to go to Toulouse. Yeah, Sorry. yeah I <laughs> was feeling that. I mean, yeah. I'm just really <laughs> intrigued. <laughs> uh, spoken from the heart and definitely rings true. I think we've got a range of challenges both within um oh i should do my introductions i am a woman i am a black woman um i have failing eyesight and i need glasses i'm in my 40s um uh i think that's it i've got a black top and uh, <laughs> it's, it's quite interesting to do this but uh, yes i've got a black top and some striped trousers so um there is there's problems in two areas. There's problems in training and then there's problem in employment and retainment of, of, of skilled workers. Um, the stuff in training is there is lots of great schemes and initiatives that are happening that are popping up. They're, they're all over. Great. However, how many of them um, end in something tangible which ends in employment? The joined up kind of bridge between training and employment is still lacking. We need to be able to train people to actually get jobs. Mm -hmm. And the when we're talking about underrepresented talent, there's lots of other things to navigate, not just the skill that they're training in, which is how do you get off in, um, universal credit? How do you sustain a career and understand what a freelancer is? Because a freelancer is a yeah. business person. Yeah. We are not teaching them how to run a business. There is so many times that I have to go into drama schools and film schools and talk to the students after they're just about to graduate and ask them, do they understand what an accountant is, what their tax return is, and how to not just run a business, but interpersonal skills, which is how do you navigate hard situations, difficult conversations, microaggressions sometimes, how do you train yourself to mentally sustain yourself through your career? And it's a, it's a whole minefield that actually not just ends in training, but also transcends to the employment space. There is lots of people that are employed in this industry that are suffering from mental health. Let's just be real, mm. okay? We love our industry, our industry is mm. beautiful. We make people happy, we, we, we can change the world, okay? However, we don't look inwards and we don't know how to appreciate and value the staff that we have. Firstly, I wanna address EDI roles, just because I might represent some people, all right? Um, there is, this, this is a really challenging space to be in, to work in especially in an EDI space in any of our industries. Uh, we have to carry the weight of representing so many different people and also bridging the gap between um, the people on the outside and the people on the inside. And that's a heavy weight on our shoulders. Essentially, there is so few of us that we're all, especially in leadership positions, that they're all scattered around different industries, having their own personal mental breakdowns and having nobody to actually talk to them or understand what they're going through. So I speak to my <coughs> colleagues in lots of great positions and I'm very privileged to be where I am too. 
There is, we, we, we do, we're forming a little community of friends that know each other, but there is no official place that mm. actually addresses bullying and harassment in the industry. And that doesn't just end with EDI, I'm talking about all of us in this room. We all need to know that there is a place where we can all go and address any issues that we're having in the workplace. That is leading to lots of holes mm. and gaps in the industry and leaks mm. because people can't sustain themselves mentally not even the financial part, which is the business side and the training, but we're talking about mental health. Um, there is lots of people that are not, okay, in the higher echelons in the, of the industry, there is a severe lack of representation, let's be real. Even within this room, we're still struggling, do you know? And I think that we are getting some people outside of the industry who have the professional skills to come into those ro roles and some of the lived experience, but they don't have the the understanding of the mechanics of working within the industry, which is causing us to create policies and uh, initiatives that are ineffective for the people that are actually on the ground, grassroots people working and trying to navigate themselves up to those positions. And that's a big problem, okay? There is another problem that people in these spaces, when we're talking about uh, EDI, we have to stop thinking about it in a, a very group by group basis. The intersectionality is the key. We are not mastering the intersectionality. Mm -hmm. For instance, I am a black woman. I'm a woman, I'm black, I'm neurodiverse. That means I have a number of challenges that I have to navigate within my space in the industry. If you send me on a program just for the fact of my color, you're negating all the other challenges that I have to have. If we look at the intersectionality, we probably include a lot more of this room, meaning that we all move together. We're all responsible for looking after each other. We're all responsible for understanding the needs of somebody else that is different from you. So I think we need to just reshape the way that we're, we're, we're thinking about bringing people into the room. And I want to say that there has to be a culture change because a lot of this, our, our industry culture is based on meetings that are in uh, cafes and uh, restaurants and bars and just as human nature you tend to socialize with the people that you identify with that already leaves half of the people out of the room especially maybe someone who speaks like me like yeah you're all right love do you know what i mean it's not it's not the same thing i might not feel comfortable and the people that haven't come from my background also don't feel comfortable that's a barrier the second barrier is the fact that people are vulnerable to, to uh, kind of accepting bad behavior because they are scared to speak out because our, our, our industry is based on reputation. So we are bringing people into the industry and having to endure certain things and keep their mouth shut about it. And there is no central hub to hold the whole culture change of the industry and individual companies to a uh, kind of national standards that we all appreciate that we need to be in. So I could talk about this for ages, so I'm going to shut up. <laughs> but I want to say that the lastly, we do need to have a culture where there is more people that are representing as many communities as possible. Simply because I know I used to have to code change to be in this industry. I used to have to say, hello, hi, mm. how are you? Yeah, okay. And honestly, mm. I left all the most interesting bit of me outside of the door. I need mm. to be able to call you babe in a meeting yeah. and you to know that I still know yeah. how to say my stuff. Yeah? I still know what I'm talking about. Mm. And the more I do it, the more we can all do it. I don't think it's about one group or another. It's about all of us feeling comfortable to be our authentic self in order to do our jobs the best way we can do. And if we are in the creative business, we're trying to represent the world. So that includes people that call you babe. <laughs> <laughs> This is a hard act to follow, but, um, and I wouldn't tell you to shop up at all. Um, but I did want to go to Katia and bring you in to, I mean, I think we're sort of starting to um, embellish that sort of framework, if you like, that I started to set out at the beginning. Um, what's your take on this coming from an international perspective and hearing some of the things that people are talking about in terms of, you know, the features of the workforce, creative workforce that are as important. How does that compare to, to other countries and, and what needs to be done about mm. it? 
No, well, first of all, I, I would like to thank you for the invitation. And of course, for me, it's, it's a real, uh, very interesting opportunity because when we started uh, the OECD to develop this work on creative industries, and this was a couple of years ago, of course, UK was a model for us. We looked a lot at these decades of policy and research and data and definitions and what cities have been doing also, Glasgow, capital of uh, culture, etc. So just a bit of a recognition of what's in this uh, room and how important it is for for other countries. Uh, uh, Leslie, what you described as uh, challenges and characteristics of the creative workforce uh, here in the UK is, of course, very common across uh, the OECD countries and, and beyond, I guess. Okay, beyond there are other issues like informality, et cetera, but it's a pretty typical um, situation. Well, highly skilled, maybe future-proof, well, we have some estimates of that, but we, we, we've done that a couple of years ago before the AI. Um, uh, so I, let, let's see how um, ChatGPT transforms the, 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 the jobs in, in the sector. Uh, well, um, really growing at a very high pace before the uh, before COVID, but uh, in the same time, uh, well, in, in stable in income, all these hybrid forms of employment, uh, little access to social protection, um, so all this is quite, quite typical for other countries. But what I wanted to, um, what I thought listening to the discussions from this morning as well, is that um, the um, understanding of the sector reached, uh, well, is now outside of this room, uh, what I mean is that there are a lot of policymakers, a lot of ministries beyond culture that finally understood the role, the economic and social impact and importance uh, of these uh, sectors. Due to COVID, of course, because I mean, uh, it, it, the, the, the crisis uh, put this, all these issues in the limelight. Uh, and people started to realize how ill adapted are the different policies, the, the social protection policies, uh, the innovation support policies, the business support policies, how ill adapted they are to the employment and business models typical for this sector, for these sectors. And that's a tremendous shift that is happening now across the OECD countries, that uh, there are small fixes or large fixes now being done to all these mainstream policies. So there is more flexibility in self-employment schemes schemes. Uh, there is a bit uh, easier access to innovation support measures. Of course, there is this whole discussion on the definition of innovation that still needs to, to take place, etc. But it's a tremendous shift and it, 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 it's a tremendous um, improvement happening right now. Uh, and just to also try to confirm that there is this tightened attention to the creative economy, just a couple of examples. G20 now has a stream on culture and creative economy, G20 in, in economic uh, development well, sort of uh, forum. Now they have uh, also culture as one of their big uh, themes. And across Europe, uh, there are plenty of regions that include culture and creative sectors in their innovation and smart specialization strategies. So it's becoming a bit of a mainstream, right? It's from a niche to a main mainstream uh, sector. Um, maybe I, um, with a couple of points closer to the skills and um, employment agenda that we're discussing now. Uh, one is about this jobs, well, creative jobs, creative occupations that are outside of creative sectors. Across OECD, there are uh, around 40% of these creative jobs that are in non-creative sectors. Um, and uh, in Europe, uh, between 2012 and 2021, these shares of jobs uh, grew by 26% compared to a small decline of creative jobs in creative sectors. What I'm trying to say is that uh, when we think about the importance of investment in arts and cultural education, let's not only think about the skills needs of neatly defined creative industries and sectors, let's think about the whole of the economy and how this education supports economic uh, development and productivity and innovation across the economy. Mm -hmm. So maybe that's a bit of a sort of argument that we are trying to make also in the OECD to justify more investment in, in this <laughs> part of the education. Uh, then a bit of another angle maybe. Uh, of course, now that the sector has reopened, the uh, people in different subsectors, they see skills shortages. Uh, why is that? Because many people just moved out of the sector to make a living dur during, uh, during the crisis. And I wanted to maybe um, focus on the uh, uh, non-creative jobs in creative sectors, which are as important yes. 
to put an artist on the stage, well, we say that there are maybe nine or 10 people that work behind the stage. You, you said that, well, we need to be sort of focusing on the heart lifting side of the creative jobs. But um, a good uh, um, IP, intellectual property rights lawyer, yeah. <laughs> can be also quite heart lifting yeah. for some yeah. of the yeah. artists. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, and well, and technicians as well, and light technicians, which are incredibly important for festivals, et cetera, et cetera. So when we think about skills provisions um, and education, we also need to think about this type of jobs, yes. uh, which are quite vital. Um, for the sector. Um, mm, 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 mm. And this also goes hand in hand with uh, the fair work principles and with the uh, decent working conditions that should be there for people to make at least a decent living out of the, the work that they do. Uh, and that, that's one of the, like, if we're talking about retention <laughs> of good talent, I mean, decent work uh, conditions is, is something, is, a, is a one of the key criteria uh, there. Um, Voila. So I have also quite a number of examples of how different countries approach this, but maybe I can... Um, yeah, no, we'll come back to that, because um, I'm conscious that Talu and, and Ruth have already started to sort of reference things that they've been involved in that work, and it'd be really good to start sort of sowing seeds about that. Um, we're not going to have enough time to sort of cover it all, I'm sure, but at least if we can um, flush some of those out, that'll be really helpful. And with that in mind, starting to think about action, <coughs> I'm looking at Robert now and um, representing, I'm not expecting you to represent the whole of government in and, and, and terms of education or, you know, UK governments, looking across the different governments, I mean, of, of different parts of the UK on education. But what sorts of things would you en emphasise that are important in terms of the DCMS agenda to really make sure that the system starts becoming responsive to industry needs, creative industry needs? Thanks, Leslie, and good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for having me, and thank you to the BFI uh, for hosting us. I sponsor the BFI from DCMS. It's a great institution, and I hope you'll come back to this very room and watch things on the screen uh, behind us. Um, I'm a civil servant, so I don't know whether I bring joy uh, to people's <laughs> lives. Um, um, I certainly get a lot of I certainly get a lot of joy from being the director for media and creative industries because it's a huge privilege um, to work on these sectors for what they can do economically, culturally, socially. And I've been a civil servant for over 20 years, and this is definitely the best gig that I've had uh, in in that time. Um, and m I and my team, many of whom are uh, in this room with us today. Uh, work very hard to try to um, be the advocates for your sectors within government, mm -hmm. but also um, to you know, uh, present the government's perspective uh, to you um, as well. Um, and um, I also am the government lead on the Eurovision Song Contest, which <laughs> I think is, <laughs> is a career high, and I can retire <laughs> after this. Um, I'm not going to start singing. Uh, there are 37 countries who will do that for you in two weeks' time. Um, but actually, I hope through that I can bring, I can bring some joy. Um, uh, and um, opening ceremony on the 7th of May in the great city of Liverpool, a former Yay. city of culture uh, as well. Um, the, I just wanted to make one point before I come on to, to the skills, and this is uh, not intended to be completely flippant, but um, uh, talking about sort of the corporate memory and um, speaking to Katerina's point about how creativity needs to be thought of in a broader sense. Mm. You know, we've had a lot of turnover in DCMS. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm on, I've been in the department for just over four years. I'm on my sixth Secretary of State. But what it does mean is that we have more people around the Cabinet table who've passed through uh, the department <laughs> than would otherwise have been the case, who have an understanding for, an interest in, and a supportive of um, the creative industries. Um, and, you know, there were some questions in the previous panel about the separation of digital mm. and mm. Uh, culture and creative industries. But, you know, the science secretary, who is going on maternity leave, obviously, and um, many congratulations to Michelle Donnan, used to be the culture mm. secretary. Um, and I don't think we should underestimate um, that talent pathway. <laughs> um, so every cloud has mm. a silver lining, uh, as they say. Um, and, Leslie, coming back to your four principles, I wanted to just sort of play with them a little bit mm -hmm. because I see... Um, 
the um, the lifelong talent pathway, the need to look from um, both early years right up through to adult education and lifelong learning um, as, as an absolutely central golden thread to how we should be approaching uh, this issue. Um, and I see your other principles around responsiveness to industry need, partnership working, and the crucial role of data as key um, cross-cutting enablers to that lifelong um, approach uh, to um, skill, education and skills that, that, that we need. Um, and I also absolutely agree that um, we need to think about that golden thread, not just in terms of different st uh, stages in the life cycle, but also across the whole economy. Because, Katerina, your point about creative skills in creative sectors and in other sectors um, is of absolute uh, importance, and I think we in the department are very keen to make uh, to tell help you tell that story about the importance of creativity more generally to the economy uh, as a whole, um, and how it can help find solutions for some of the big challenges that we are all all facing. So um, we, um, I mean, in DCMS, we are the um, the spokespeople for uh, the creative industries, but we don't hold all of the levers. Um, and so we are working as closely as possible with our colleagues in the Department for Education, um, in the Treasury, um, and um, other departments to try and address these ch the challenges at uh, every stage. Um, you know, we are working on a cultural education plan, uh, for example, with uh, DFE uh, to try and look at that's the school age uh, needs, um, and we hope to be able to make some progress on that uh, in this in this year, um, we um, are trying to infuse more young people um, and um, get them thinking about some of the, the broad range of challenges that you spoke about, Tulu, through the Discover Creative Careers program, where we're working uh, with uh, industry partners to get out into schools and and um, tell people about um, how exciting creative careers can be. Um, there's also a role, in fact, of educating their parents uh, oh, as well. This is key. Uh, to that is a big one. To understand uh, that there is a future yeah. that you can have uh, in the creative industries, as long as all of those other factors that the other panellists have spoken about in terms of fair work and good work mm. uh, are also uh, mm. addressed. And um, the uh, Policy and Evidence Centre have published the Good Work uh, Review um, and through the Creative Industries Council, which Baz uh, chairs, we are hoping to work through its recommendations with, uh, between government and industry in a, in a structured way to try to address the very important issues that that piece of work highlighted. Um, lots of you in the room will have um, priorities about reform in T-levels, in the way that the apprenticeship levy and apprentices more generally work, we in DCMS have been trying uh, to test different approaches in that context. We've um, had various pilots uh, around uh, flexi jobs and portable apprenticeships because we recognise that in the creative industries, a 12-month placement uh, you know, that starts in the same place and ends in the same place doesn't really reflect the reality. Mm. And um, you know, we are doing our very best uh, within government to try and make the case for more flexibility uh, within that. Um, boot camps is another really important area, especially if you look at the um, upper end of the, of the age spectrum, uh, where uh, we think we can um, bring more returners and, and older workers uh, back into the workforce uh, as well. And finally, because I know we're tight on time, um, to your point on, on data, um, the DfE are launching the um, unit for uh, future skills, um, and we are engaging with them very actively to ensure that that does include um, information and, and labour market data on uh, the creative industries as well. So I, I'm not at all suggesting that we are ticking every box yeah. and that we're where we need to be. But um, from the DCMS perspective, and certainly from my current Secretary of State's perspective, skills and education mm. are right up there as top priorities for these sectors. <laughs> Well, I've totally failed in my role of chair and engaging the audience to ask all these questions because you've run out of time. <laughs> so, um, one, one question. 
<laughs> well, I suppose in the context of you know where we ended up, some of the, I mean, if I summarised a lot of the questions, it's 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 basically suggesting that there are good developments underway, but are they going sufficiently enough? You know, so lots of people are seeking to improve them, and if one person was going to come forward and sort of volunteer a view on what's the, the sort of critical area that we need to pay more attention. You know, in terms of the reforms, are we progressing things sufficiently in all of the areas, or are there areas that just require a bit more attention in terms of some of the future reforms? I don't know, Ruth, if I'll some of the work you said about quick. what works. I think, I think we all seem to agree education is important, but on a day when uh, school teachers in England are on strike, mm. and, uh, you know, I'm the head of school, I line manage 60-odd people who are going to be taking strike action, our education workforce are doing that for a reason. So if we want them to be the enablers of a new creative generation, we need to think about how we invest in them so that they understand and have hands-on experience and have time to breathe. Yes. For me, that would be key. Yeah. Can I add one? Yeah, I think on. that's a very good point. Um, is the neurodiverse that we are overrepresented with neurodiverse people in the industry because we're a skills-based industry. That's why we come and our brains work really well at creativity. But we are operating in an academic format, okay, which requires lots of people to do application <coughs> funding, um, understand how to communicate in a certain way that keeps you out. And I just think that we need to broaden our mind about how we actually communicate and uh, kind of bring people in and make sure that they can navigate the system in a way that makes sense to them and doesn't take away from any of the impact and contributions that they can do for all of us in the industry. Okay. Well, I think, I think you can, I can already see that you agree with me that this has been an absolutely fabulous discussion. It's been really fantastic to hear from all of our speakers. It's an enormous agenda but it's a really important agenda, and we are starting to sort of progress a little bit along the journey. So let's keep that momentum, build that momentum. Lots of questions in here, but lots of opportunities to meet the panel, or mix with the panel, and continue the discussion in the margins of, of the conference. Um, but let's um, just share appreciation for the speakers in the usual way. Thank you very much.